Hi folks, so continuing on the topic of access controls, which is essentially how you define who's allowed to do what on a system, uh, we're going to look at access control models, which is really how you uh, kind of model or represent who's allowed to do what on your system, and uh, it has an impact on what abstractions you use, so how you're defining the rules for your system, and also who gets to set those rules. So really, quite broadly, there's two main categories of access control models. There's discretionary access control and non-discretionary or mandatory access controls. So discretionary access controls is when the users are allowed to kind of own the files that they create, or that they get to have ownership over the files, and decide who's allowed to access those files in what ways. So when you create a file, you get to choose. All right, well, I want this user or this group of users to be able to access this file. Um, and they can do that without involving anyone else. So there's no need to get special permission from an administrator or something. If you own the files, then you can set who's allowed to access them. Um, so that's actually the kind of security that's built into most like consumer operating systems. So if you're using a Linux or Mac or you know um, Windows system, then it's based on discretionary access control. So you get to create a file, and if you've got multiple users on that system, you get to say who gets to access those files. Um, if you look at older versions of Windows, so Windows Millennium Edition, if you've got the misfortune to have experienced that firsthand, and anything earlier, so like Windows 95 and so on, they didn't actually provide any user-oriented access controls at all. So basically, as soon as you look, everyone's an admin. There, well, there was nothing other than the ability to do everything. But when you log in, that login screen is literally like, if you know the password, you get to have your desktop wallpaper and those set of icons. But you know, there's nothing else there. Um, and then it was in um, Windows XP where they actually started to introduce discretionary access controls. But because of the history that Windows had of everyone running as administrator, um, like a lot of software that existed for Windows, which they wanted to be backwards compatible for, wouldn't work unless you were an administrator. Um, and so you kind of perpetuated this idea that you had to be an admin on, on Windows XP. Um, and when Windows Vista came along, they tried to ease that transition of like allowing you to uh, have the ability to escalate to admin when you needed it. And they introduced the UAC, which is basically those uh, pop-ups. It's like, oh, trying to install some software. Are you sure you want it to be able to do this? You know, it's trying to do some kind of admin action, um, which is a great idea in terms of like, it's much better than everyone running as an administrator all the time. But it got panned for the usability because suddenly security was in everyone's face. Like, why am I being prompted for this? Like, of course I want to allow it to. I clicked it. Um, and so since then, they've tried to improve the UI experience of that. Um, but it was actually a step forward in terms of security being better than the, what it was before then. Um, and they they needed to tweak the kind of actions that prompted the dialogue and, and the rest of it. Um, but meanwhile, Unix, including the earliest versions of Linux, have had discretionary access control since the start. So since the 1970s, or uh, you know when it was first released, has, has always had that built into the system. So what you happens normally on a discretionary access control um, system, like where you, you know, like Linux, for example, you start a process up. So if, I, if I'm a user, I'm sitting at the computer and I start a program, the process starts and it is, um, has the user identity associated with that process, so the UID. And, um, and then all the decisions that get made are based on that UID. So when you have a system that, where all the decisions are basically based on the identity of the person, that's also known as a, an identity-based access controls. So in practice, what that means is all the programs are running around with all of your privileges. And so there's a bunch of, like, there's a problem of ambient authority. So you've got a lot of processes that have a lot of uh, power to do things in your name. Um, that's how these systems are designed, basically. So, but so hypothetically, or not that hypothetically, actually, a program running can just like set all the permissions on all of your files quite easily. Um, can you know do all the things that you're allowed to do on the system.
and you're kind of working on the assumption that they're working for you. Uh, but that's that is the the way that most operating systems work as a as a starting point. So non-discretionary or mandatory access controls is where the policy is defined by someone else, like an administrator, so it's defined for the system, and then that applies to all the users. The users don't get to choose, they don't get to set the rules. Admin sets the rules, and if you create a file, well, you just you happen you might happen to be the creator creator of that file. That doesn't really give you the ability to set the rules for that file. That's the job of the system, system administrator. So the reason why we say just non-discretionary or mandatory is that um, traditionally mandatory access controls were defined based on like a formal notation, basically like this lattice structure of mathematical um, set of rules about who's allowed to access what. Um, and it's an active area of, of, of research, um, but more broadly, the term non-discretionary and also the term mandatory access controls gets used in the broad sense of being that the users don't get to choose. Um, so you, you know you might come across either of those terminologies. So so yeah, so mandatory access control is it makes sense. It's well suited for when an organisation owns the data and they want to have like tight control over everything that happens to it. So for example, the military or the government, um, so particularly military, so um, you know, the NSA actually created SE Linux um, to basically introduce mandatory access controls into Linux. Um, but it can help to prevent users from misconfiguring permissions because it takes all those powers away from the users essentially and it creates some predictable policy. And um, so mandatory access controls, typically they work by attaching a security context label, um, like a clearance label to, to the objects on the system, and they attach a separate label, like a classification or a domain, to all the subjects or the processes, and then you have rules that define what interactions are allowed between uh, classification levels and clearance levels. Uh, so it's like, you know, basically they have to match in order to access the file, for example. Um, so as I was saying before, traditionally the, the models, access control models are defined using a formal math notation and seminal models like the Bell and Lepadula model or the Biber model, they're forced on providing either the strong confidentiality or strong integrity like um, separately basically. Um, in reality, even um, the military want some control over integrity even if Confidentiality is actually the highest priority. So in reality, um, you know, those models might not actually be used um, that much because actually we need a hybrid of, the, of those um, kind of objectives, security objectives. So now a lot of consumer operating systems have started to have aspects of um, access controls that aren't configured by end users. So it's a, a form of non-discretionary and mandatory access controls. So for example, on Linux, you've now got SE Linux, um, which is, was created by NSA, um, but it is, um, you know, you can use that to use like classification levels and uh, to do multi-level security and domain and type enforcement and role-based access controls. So it's like um, mix of security models, basically, that, that um, you can define very, very powerful set of mandatory access controls. It's quite complicated, the policy and, and, and administering SE Linux is, is you know, it's, it's complicated, but it's very powerful. AppArmor is a simpler um, mandatory access control system, uh, which has a simpler set of rules, but both of those systems control uh, on a system level what different programs are allowed to do. Typically what you'll see is that you'll have um, administrators will use um, those systems to lock down services on a system and then you, you know users still get to use their discretionary access controls to choose what they do with their files uh, but then there's like the we'll use these mandatory access controls to add an extra layer of security um, but yeah for the most part most systems are, are based on discretionary access controls role-based access controls is a um, it's a way of using abstractions to um, set policy. It's typically it's non-discretionary, so you know the users don't get to choose. 
But the important thing is it adds this idea of a role um, and you have uh, user sessions, they get to use these roles. Often they can activate or deactivate specific roles, which are often like hierarchical. So you've got a role that might be based on another role and it, and it gives the users that have those roles um, a certain set of permissions. Um, and so for example, when you're ministering um, like the security for a hospital and you've got all the nurse in an organization need nurses need to have a specific um, set of privilege level then every time you get a new nurse you just add, give them that role but there might also be a nurse but also a spe specialized nurse or, or a um, specific doctor under certain um, you know with, under certain conditions and then they might also get those roles and that will give them access to those things as well. So it's similar to the simpler idea of using groups and access controls, but has extra features. Um, digital rights management is also a kind of access controls, although it's a little bit backwards in what it's intended for. So the idea of DRM is that you have these third parties that are providing some content and they get to choose how you use that content. Um, and so they're trying to actually get you to enforce policy on your local machine. Um, and so they define what the policy is on their systems and, and you run, get access to the media through software that doesn't let you copy it, for example. Um, so the simple example of that is like a PDF document that has a, uh, some metadata attached to it that says, uh, just by the way, don't let the users print this file. Now, if the software is behaving like you use Adobe Reader and it enforces that rule, then it won't let you print that file. Um, however, you probably just download a different PDF reader and it will still let you print that file. So obviously, it's quite easy to circumvent um, you know, that specific rule. Um, but you know, um, unless they've got some even more complicated like um, uh, encoding and encryption in place that will only let uh, authorized readers access the file. Um, which is obviously what they try and do. Um, you know, still then you can take a screenshot of your screen. So, you know, digital rights management is, is quite uh, obviously challenging, but they want to limit what you can do with the files and the resources that you have access to. And there's something called remote attestation, which is essentially where you prove over the network that the software that you've got running on your computer is limiting your actions um, and, and enforcing the DRM. Uh, and then, so it will check that over the network before it sends you a copy of the file so that, you know, you then use that uh, DRM software to access the files. And just final, um, some more kind of terminology around access controls or some more kinds of access control. Um, if your access controls um, based on a bunch of decisions, not just the identity of the user, but based on multiple other criteria, um, or other criteria in addition to that, then you can call that attribute-based access controls. So as opposed to just identity-based, it's deciding based on a bunch of other stuff as well. And usage control, or UCON, is, refers to when you've got certain obligations and conditions that need to be met before you, access is granted. So for example, you have to have done something first, like agree to some terms and conditions, uh, or you're only allowed to do it at certain times of the day, and then, um, and if you have agreed to those things, then it will let you do uh, have access to the files. So that's usage control. So we've just um, you know given an overview. Again, the main one is the difference between discretionary access controls and mandatory access control models. And um, you know there's a bunch of other um, related concepts in there that we've also discussed, uh, like role-based access controls.